Now, before doing that, I'd like to define two device configurations that's necessary for the top device of the tandem. This is the substrate and the superstrate configuration. What defines which one it is depends on where the glass is located. If the glass is on the bottom of the device structure, it is called the substrate configuration, hence the word sub, right? makes a lot of sense. And in the superstrate configuration, the glass is located on the top of the structure, hence the word super. So these are the substrate and superstrate configurations. And this is a very important because of the font for two reasons. One is, in order for you to sell modules or panels to anyone, it has to be certified by IEC or UL. And in order to be certified, you have to pass certain tests. One of those tests is that your panel must survive a hailstorm you hurled at at 100 miles an hour. Okay. I kid you not. So therefore, in order to make that happen, you really need to package it properly, which means you really need to have a piece of glass on the top. Well, in the superstrict configuration, that's already there. So that's all you need. However, in the substrate configuration, there's no glass, there's no packaging on the top. So you, in actuality, what we have to do is put another glass there. So the superstrict configuration enables a lower cost packaging. There's only one piece of glass. The rest of it can be sealed by, by um, basically encapsulating in, in some type of um, hermetic sealant. So it's much cheaper in that case. But this, yes? An aluminum. They have to do something uh, for the uh, flexible, uh, for the flexible thin films. They have to do something still to be able to uh, pass that test. So, and but that's not the most difficult part of a flexible PV. There are other issues involved with it. Things such as shunting, um, high temperature diffusion. Um, I could give a seminar on that. <laughs> But it's very difficult to do. We selected glass as the main um, material because, for one thing, it is cheap. You can get it in very large quantities anywhere in the world. The glass you see here, that's all soda line glass. You can buy soda line glass anywhere in the world. And secondly, it's very, very flat. And so it's, a, and it's dielectric, so you have to worry about issues of shunting, things of that kind. Now, some people may say glass is the wrong thing to do because it's heavy. Um, we could have a very good discussion on that, but I can tell you at this point that Stein decided to go with glass. Um, we'll see how that works out. So that's good. So the other important issue here with, uh, with the subject superstrate is the following. The six materials, six devices, function significantly better in a subject configuration, whereas cat telluride functions much better as a superstrate configuration. The reason for that is a little involved, so I won't go into this discussion, but that's important to recognize as well. Therefore, SIGs, almost all SIGs, if not all of them, operate in a subject configuration. And cat is a super straight. That's what you'll see. So these are the tandem structures that Stein uses. This is, these are the tandems, right? So this is the one in the subject configuration, and this is in the super straight. Now, I've used this term loosely. When I say substrate tandem, what I really mean is that that's the configuration for the top device of the tandem. And when I say super straight, that's the configuration for the top device of the tandem. And we're developing both of these configurations. So again, if you look at this, here's the top device, and here's the bottom. And in this case, both bottom, de bottom devices are in the substrate configuration because we are using SIGs for our bottom device. Okay. So why is this important? Well, it turns out that for us, it's actually rather elegant because our Gen 1 material, our Gen 1 product, which is in production at, in Hattiesburg, functions as our bottom device. So for our tandem, we already have a production line in place to make our tandem. We really need to put another production line in for the top device, and we're working out whether we should have that as a substrate or superstrate configuration. Excuse me. Okay. So what goes into that determination is the manufacturability of the tandem structure itself. If you look at a conventional monolithic tandem, as you would see using conventional wafer-based systems like silicon or 3.5 systems and things of that kind, they look like this. What you essentially do is deposit layer upon layer until you finish making the tandem. All right, so here's the bottom, here's a tunnel junction, here's a top device, and so forth and so on. Now there are two problems associated with this. One is that um, as you deposit each subsequent layer, you have to deposit in a way that does not affect very much the lower layers. Oftentimes, you have to compromise the upper layers 
to ensure that you do not destroy or compromise the lower layer. So oftentimes things like temperature and pressures are compromised to make that happen. A second more important thing with regard to manufacturability is that there are a large number of layers here on the order of 14 or so. So keep in mind, you have to deposit all of these layers before you're done. So for example, if you're depositing this and you're on, the, let's say, the 10th layer and you screw up, the entire thing's gone. So it's very difficult to get high yields in this configuration. But the efficiencies are very high. For Stein, we use mechanically stacked tandem. In, in essence, what we do is we, we manufacture the top device, we manufacture the bottom device, and we literally laminate them together. Just like how you would do when you, when you get your, let's say your driver's license laminate, you just laminate together, we do the same thing. Okay. Why is this useful? It's because the processing of the top and the bottom devices are decoupled we can independently and fully optimize the top and the bottom device without concern about the lower devices, and then we just laminate them together. That's fantastic for simplicity and the yield itself, because keep in mind that the, each of these, these devices now have only four layers, so if you mess up, you really don't destroy everything. So the yields are very high in this case. Another thing to notice is that there's no tunnel junction here. Why is that important? It's because Tunnel junctions are notorious for being unreliable, particularly at a large size. Even for wafer-based systems, if you look at things that people have done, uh, just optimizing the tunnel junction can increase efficiency for them because of the reliability issue. Well, we are working on full-size panels, and it's very difficult to make a reliable tunnel junction at that size in a manufacturing environment. We don't use any tunnel junctions. Right? Yes? That's a very good, I was hoping that no one would ask that question. <laughs> so let me answer that. That's a very good question. We can make this in four terminals or two terminals. Clearly, four terminals is the easiest for us. So you have two coming out of the top, two coming out of the bottom, and you add the two efficiencies together. But we can make it two terminal by connecting the two center terminals together. But you can only do that if you can match, if you can match the current. And that's an important part that we file the pen on this. It turns out that we can still fully optimize the top and the bottom devices and match the current at the same time. And the reason, and the way, I can't tell you how we're doing it, but I, I can tell you this. It is the current that has to be matched, not the current density. So there are ways to make the current match. And we do that as well. So we make four and two terminal devices. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so now we'll move on to the goals and status and the development plan, uh, the development plan for Stion. So these are our internal goals that I can tell you about. Um, number one, we're going to demonstrate our Gen 2 tandem efficiency at greater than 18% on a 20 by 20 level. I actually have a, um, an example of one which I'll sh show you later after the presentation. The next is to scale it up to a full size panel of one square meter. It's about 65 by 165 centimeters squared by the end, toward the end of this year. We are working very rapidly in trying to make that happen. It's a very hard thing to do. And thirdly, along the way, establish the foundation for higher efficiency Gen 3 devices to get to 25% or greater. Again, again this are uh, full-size panels that are non-concentrated. So where do we stand right now? This is where we stand currently at Stion. At the 20 by 20 level, we are currently at 20% efficiency for a, full, uh, for a 20 by 20 centimeter squared tandem at this size, or 20% efficiency. And we got there with a top device of 13% and a bottom device of 7%. That is very significant because we get a significant amount of efficiency from the bottom device. If we look at a cell from that device, we're at 22% efficiency. Now that's important because what it tells us is that greater than 20% efficiency with our thin film technology is very achievable, and we believe that we can do that as well. So all of this comes at a great expense of doing some very difficult material science uh, solving some very difficult material science problems, and I'll go over that in my presentation. But the point I want to get across here is that the technology is disruptive, novel, differentiated, and will be game-changing once we get to the full-size panel. Keep in mind, at 20% efficiency, this is a roughly a SIGS-type uh, SIGS material. If you remember, the, 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 um, the champion efficiency of a SIGS cell is about 20%. It's about that big. This is a 20% circuit 
at 20 by 20 centimeters, so it's this big. So that's a significant uh, achievement there. And we're working to scale that up to full size panel. So it's, it's important because it's the highest efficiency and lowest cost near term tin film technology that we know of right now. It's also a unique structure where the bill of materials, how much it costs to put this all together, is comparable to the single junction device. That's a very important point because if you think about this, most people, if I asked you how much would a tandem cost, most of you would say it would be twice the cost of a single junction device, and that's not true. In fact, in this case, the bill of materials is very comparable to a single junction device. And the way you can see that is, let me go back to this structure here. Here's a super straight configuration. If I said to you, let's make a single junction device, it would look like this. You'd have the bottom glass, you have the actual device, a few microns of thin film, and you have a top glass to encapsulate it. Well, the tandem is exactly the same, except under the top glass, you have a few microns of thin film that constitutes the top device. Anyway, uh, moving forward. Um, and so, this structure also enables very high volume manufacturing at very high yields for the reasons we discussed earlier. It also, when we scale it up, will be the highest power output at a square meter close to 200 watts. So this is the development plan we have for the tandem. This is what we would use to increase the efficiency to the, to the levels that we talked about. In this case, again, the tandem consists of the top device right on top of the bottom device. And keep in mind what happens is that for the top device, it absorbs everything from the UV to the red, converts that to electricity, and transmits the near-infrared to the bottom device, which then absorbs all of that and converts that to electricity. The key to the tandem efficiency are these two things here at a very high level. It is the high transmission of the top device and the high efficiency of the top device. You can clearly see the brunt of the technology development involves the top device. Now, I have to ask you, of these two here, which one is the most challenging and difficult? Yeah, I guess you can tell that I italicized it, right? <laughs> yeah, it is the most difficult. We spent a tremendous amount of time getting the transmission high, and I'll show you what I mean by that uh, later in the presentation. So to get to the high transmission, yes? Yes, it is our first generation. It's six, right. To the top? Um, I cannot tell you. <laughs> it's a proprietary material. I'll tell you how we make it, uh, a little bit of how we make it and what differentiates it, but um, there's a considerable amount of IP that goes into that. Um, yes, I'll, I'll tell you that in, uh, in a little bit. So to get to the, to, so each of these points here, um, to get to the device transmission, it really comes down to two things. The transmission of the TCO, the transparent conducting oxide, which are the electrodes. By the way, it doesn't have to be an oxide, it just has to be transparent. We happen to be using oxides at this point. We have others that we have developing for the next generation technology. It also has to have a good transmission of the absorber, particularly below the band edge. Okay. To get to, to the, um, the high efficiency of the top device, there are three things in general we have to do. High absorber quality, extraordinarily important not surprising. Lower variation uh, across the entire um, panel, meaning that the aerial uniformity has to be very large, uh, very good. And finally, low interfacial recombination. Why interfacial recombination in particular is because in, for chocolate pyrides, which is what these are, for six, the low bandgap materials tend to have most of the recombination occur in the bulk, whereas in the wider bandgap materials that we're using right now, most of the recombination occurs at interfaces. So Decrease of the interface recombination is a must, and I'll talk about how we do that. So before moving forward, I'd like to point out an important interplay between the efficiency and the transmission of the top device. They seem mutually exclusive, and actually, in some ways, they are. Here I've plotted the efficiency as a function of the top absorber thickness. This is the efficiency of the top device, and you can see that as the absorber increases, the efficiency of the top device increases, as you would expect. But the efficiency of the bottom device decreases, again, as you would expect, because you're absorbing more and more of the light as you make the, the top absorber thicker. The tandem, of course, is the sum of those two for ter four terminal uh, device. You can see that the tandem would operate not at the highest efficiency of the top device, but rather a compromise between the efficiency and the transmission. So this is an important interplay that I, I want to mention to you. It is the sweet spot, so to speak, in which you have to make this happen. <laughs> 